Think some other phase of engine operation is not correct. In such cases, determine and correct the cause of the difficulty. A general guide to check and adjust the idle mixture and speed on many types of reciprocating engine is discussed in the following paragraphs. Always refer to the appropriate manual for specific information. Before checking the idle mixture on any engine, warm up the engine until oil and cylinder head temperatures are normal. Keep the propeller control in the increase RPM setting throughout the entire process of warming up the engine. Always make idle mixture adjustments with cylinder head temperatures at normal values. The idle mixture adjustment is made on the idle mixture fuel control valve. Figure 2-46. It should not be confused with the adjustment of the idle speed stop. The importance of idle mixture adjustment cannot be overstressed. Optimum engine operation at low speeds can be obtained only when proper fuel-slash-air mixtures are delivered to every cylinder of the engine. Excessively rich idle mixtures, and the resultant incomplete combustion are responsible for more spark plug fouling than any other single cause. Excessively lean idle mixtures result in faulty acceleration. Furthermore, the idle mixture adjustment affects the fuel-slash-air mixture and engine operation well up into the cruise range. Figure 2-46. Idle mixture adjustment for carburetor. On an engine with a conventional carburetor. The idle mixture is checked by manually leaning the mixture with the cockpit mixture control. Move the carburetor mixture control slowly and smoothly toward the idle cutoff position. On installations that do not use a manifold pressure gauge, it is necessary to observe the tachometer for an indication of an RPM change. With most installations, the idle mixture should be adjusted to provide an RPM rise prior to decreasing as the engine ceases to fire. This RPM increase varies from 10 to 50 RPM, depending on the installation. Following the momentary increase in RPM, the engine speed starts to drop. Immediately move the mixture control back to rich to prevent the engine from stopping completely. On a RSA fuel injection engines, the optimum idle setting is one that is rich enough to provide a satisfactory acceleration under all conditions, and lean enough to prevent spark plug fouling or rough operation. A rise of 25-50 RPM as the mixture control is moved to the idle cutoff position usually satisfies both of these conditions. The actual idle mixture adjustment is made by the lengthening, or shortening of the linkage between the throttle lever and the idle lever. Figure 2-47 if the check of the idle mixture reveals it to be too lean or too rich, increase or decrease the idle fuel flow as required. Then, repeat the check. Continue checking and adjusting the idle mixture until it checks out properly. During this process, it may be desirable to move the idle speed stop completely out of the way and to hold the engine speed at the desired RPM by means of the throttle. This eliminates the need for frequent readjustments of the idle stop as the idle mixture is improved and the idle speed picks up. After each adjustment, clear the engine by briefly running it at higher RPM. This prevents fouling of the plugs which might otherwise be caused by incorrect idle mixture. After adjusting the idle mixture, recheck it several times to determine definitively that the mixture is correct and remains constant on repeated changes from high power back to idle. Correct any inconsistency in engine idling before releasing the aircraft for service. Setting the idle mixture on the Continental TCM fuel injection system consists of a conventional spring-loaded screw located in the air throttle lever. Figure 2-48. The fuel pump pressure is part of the basic calibration and requires servicing to make sure the pump pressure are set correctly before making idle adjustments. The idle mixture adjustment is the lock nut at the metering valve end of the linkage between the metering valve and the air throttle levers. Tightening the nut to shorten the linkage provides a richer mixture. A leaner mixture is obtained by backing off the nut to lengthen the linkage. Adjust to obtain a slight and momentary gain in idle speed as the mixture control is slowly moved toward idle cutoff. If the idle mixture is set too lean, the idle speed drops with no gain in speed. Idle speed adjustment. After adjusting the idle mixture, Reset the idle stop to the idle RPM specified in the aircraft maintenance manual. The engine must be warmed up thoroughly and checked for ignition system malfunctioning. Throughout any carburetor adjustment procedure, periodically run the engine up to approximately half of normal rated speed to clear the engine. 2-31 Inlet fuel pressure tap, fuel inlet and strainer, idle speed adjustment, metered fuel outlet, idle mixture adjustment, idle valve, impact air. Figure 2-47 Bendix adjustment of idle mixture linkage. Idle speed adjustment idle mixture adjustment. Figure 2-48. TCM adjustment points. Some carburetors are equipped with an eccentric screw to adjust idle RPM. Others use a spring-loaded screw to limit the throttle valve closing. In either case, adjust the screw as required to increase or decrease RPM with the throttle retarded against the stop. Open the throttle to clear the engine, close the throttle and allow the RPM to stabilize. Repeat this operation until the desired idling speed is obtained. Fuel system inspection and maintenance. The inspection of a fuel system installation consists basically of an examination of the system for conformity to design requirements together with functional tests to prove correct operation. Since there are considerable variations in the fuel systems used on different aircraft, no attempt has been made to describe any particular system in detail. It is important that the manufacturer's instructions for the aircraft concerned be followed when performing inspection or maintenance functions. Complete system. Inspect the entire system for wear, damage, or leaks. Make sure that all units are securely attached and properly safeted. The drain plugs or valves in the fuel system should be opened to check for the presence of sediment or water. The filter and sump should also be checked for sediment, water, or slime. The filters or screens. 
including those provided for flow meters and auxiliary pumps, must be clean and free from corrosion. The controls should be checked for freedom of movement, security of locking, and freedom from damage due to chafing. The fuel vents should be checked for correct positioning and freedom from obstruction. Otherwise, fuel flow or pressure. 2-32 Fueling may be affected. Filler neck drains should be checked for freedom from obstruction. If booster pumps are installed, the system should be checked for leaks by operating the pumps. During this check, the ammeter or load meter should be read and the readings of all the pumps, where applicable, should be approximately the same. Fuel tanks. All applicable panels in the aircraft skin or structure should be removed and the tanks inspected for corrosion on the external surfaces, for security of attachment, and for correct adjustment of straps and slings. Check the fittings and connections for leaks or failures. Some fuel tanks manufactured of light alloy materials are provided with inhibitor cartridges to reduce the corrosive effects of combined leaded fuel and water. Where applicable, the cartridge should be inspected and renewed at the specified periods. Lines and fittings. Be sure that the lines are properly supported and that the nuts and clamps are securely tightened. To tighten hose clamps to the proper torque, use a hose clamp torque wrench. If this wrench is not available, tighten the clamp finger tight, plus the number of turns specified for the hose and clamp. If the clamps do not seal at the specified torque, replace the clamps, the hose, or both. After installing a new hose, check the clamps daily and tighten if necessary. When this daily check indicates that cold flow has ceased, inspect the clamps at less frequent intervals. Replace the hose if the plies have separated. If there is excessive cold flow, or if the hose is hard and inflexible, permanent impressions from the clamp and cracks in the tube or cover stock indicate excessive cold flow. Replace any hose that has collapsed at the bends, or as a result of misaligned fittings or lines. Some hoses tend to flare at the ends beyond the clamps. This is not an unsatisfactory condition, unless leakage is present. Blisters may form on the outer synthetic rubber cover of the hose. These blisters do not necessarily affect the serviceability of the hose. When a blister is discovered on a hose, remove the hose from the aircraft and puncture the blister with a pin. The blister should then collapse. If fluid, oil, fuel, or hydraulic emerges from the pinhole in the blister, reject the hose. If only air emerges, then test the hose pressure at one and one half times the working pressure. If no fluid leakage occurs, the hose can be regarded as serviceable. Puncturing the outer cover of the hose may permit the entry of corrosive elements, such as water, which could attack the wire braiding and ultimately result in failure. For this reason, Puncturing the outer covering of hoses exposed to the elements should be avoided. The external surface of hose may develop fine cracks, usually short in length, which are caused by surface aging. The hose assembly may be regarded as serviceable, provided these cracks do not penetrate to the first braid. Selector valves. Rotate selector valves and check for free operation, excessive backlash, and accurate pointer indication. If the backlash is excessive, check the entire operating mechanism for worn joints, loose pins, and broken drive lugs. Replace any defective parts. Inspect cable control systems for worn or frayed cables, damaged pulleys, or worn pulley bearings. Pumps. During an inspection of booster pumps, check for the following conditions. 1. Proper operation. 2. Leaks and condition of fuel and electrical connections. 3. Wear of motor brushes. Be sure the drain lines are free of traps, bends, or restrictions. Check the engine-driven pump for leaks and security of mounting. Check the vent and drain lines for obstructions. Main line strainers. Drain water and sediment from the main line strainer at each pre-flight inspection. Remove and clean the screen at the period specified in the airplane maintenance manual. Examine the sediment removed from the housing. Particles of rubber are often early warnings of hose deterioration. Check for leaks and damaged gaskets. Fuel quantity gauges. If a sight gauge is used, be sure that the glass is clear, and that there are no leaks at the connections. Check the lines leading to it for leaks and security of attachment. Check the mechanical gauges for free movement of the float arm, and for proper synchronization of the pointer with the position of the float. On the electrical and electronic gauges. Be sure that both the indicator and the tank units are securely mounted and that their electrical connections are tight. 2-33 Fuel pressure gauge. Check the pointer for zero tolerance and excessive oscillation. Check the cover glass for looseness and for proper range markings. Check the lines and connections for leaks. Be sure that there is no obstruction in the vent. Replace the instrument if it is defective. Pressure warning signal. Inspect the entire installation for security of mounting and condition of the electrical, fuel, and air connections. Check the lamp by pressing the test switch to see that it lights. Check the operation by turning the battery switch on, building up pressure with the booster pump, and observing the pressure at which the light goes out. If necessary, adjust the contact mechanism. Water injection systems for reciprocating engines. These systems have very limited use in modern aircraft engines. Water injection was used mostly on large radial engines. The water injection system enabled more power to be obtained from the engine at takeoff than is possible without water injection. The carburetor. Operating at high power settings, delivers more fuel to the engine than it actually needs. A leaner mixture would produce more power, however, the additional fuel is necessary to prevent overheating and detonation. With the injection of the antibetonant fluid, 
the mixture can be leaned out to that which produces maximum power. And the vaporization of the water alcohol mixture then provides the cooling formerly supplied by the excess fuel. Turbine engine fuel system, general requirements. The fuel system is one of the more complex aspects of the gas turbine engine. It must be possible to increase or decrease the power at will to obtain the thrust required for any operating condition. In turbine-powered aircraft, this control is provided by varying the flow of fuel to the combustion chambers. However, some turboprop aircraft also use variable pitch propellers, thus, the selection of thrust is shared by two controllable variables, fuel flow and propeller blade angle. The quantity of fuel supplied must be adjusted automatically to correct for changes in ambient temperature or pressure. If the quantity of fuel becomes excessive in relation to mass airflow through the engine, the limiting temperature of the turbine blades can be exceeded, or it will produce compressor stall and a condition referred to as rich blowout. Rich blowout occurs when the amount of oxygen in the air supply is insufficient to support combustion, and when the mixture is cooled below the combustion temperature by the excess fuel. The other extreme, lean flame out, occurs if the fuel quantity is reduced proportionally below the air quantity. The engine must operate through acceleration and deceleration without any fuel control related problems. The fuel system must deliver fuel to the combustion chambers not only in the right quantity, but also in the right condition for satisfactory combustion. The fuel nozzles form part of the fuel system and atomize or vaporize the fuel so that it ignites and burns efficiently. The fuel system must also supply fuel, so that the engine can be easily started on the ground and in the air. This means that the fuel must be injected into the combustion chambers in a combustible condition during engine starting, and that combustion must be sustained while the engine is accelerating to its normal idling speed. Another critical condition to which the fuel system must respond occurs during a rapid acceleration. When the engine is accelerated, energy must be furnished to the turbine in excess of that necessary to maintain a constant RPM. However, if the fuel flow increases too rapidly, an over-rich mixture can be produced with the possibility of a rich blowout or compressor stall. Turbofan, turbojet, turboshaft, and turboprop engines are equipped with a fuel control unit, which automatically satisfies the requirements of the engine. Although the basic requirements apply generally to all gas turbine engines, the way in which individual fuel controls meet these needs cannot be conveniently generalized. Turbine fuel controls. Gas turbine engine fuel controls can be divided into three basic groups. 1. Hydromechanical. 2. Hydromechanical slash electronic. 3. Full Authority Digital Engine, or Electronics, Control, FADEC. The hydromechanical slash electronic fuel control is a hybrid of the two types of fuel control, but can function solely as a hydromechanical control. In the dual mode, inputs and outputs are electronic, and fuel flow is set by servo motors. The third type, FADEC, uses electronic sensors for its inputs and controls fuel flow with electronic outputs. The FADEC type control gives the electronic controller, computer, complete control. The computing section of the FADEC system depends completely on sensor inputs to the electronic engine control, EEC, to meter the fuel flow. The fuel metering device meters the fuel using only outputs from the EEC. Most turbine fuel controls are quickly going to the FADEC type of control. This electronically controlled fuel control is very accurate in scheduling fuel by sensing many of the engine parameters. 2-34 Regardless of the type, all fuel controls accomplish essentially the same function. That function is to schedule the fuel flow to match the power required by the pilot. Some sense more engine variables than others. The fuel control can sense many different inputs, such as power lever position, engine RPM for each spool, compressor inlet pressure and temperature, burner pressure, compressor discharge pressure, and many more parameters as needed by the specific engine. These variables affect the amount of thrust that an engine produces for a given fuel flow. By sensing these parameters, the fuel control has a clear picture of what is happening in the engine, and can adjust fuel flow as needed. Each type of turbine engine has its own specific needs for fuel delivery and control. Hydromechanical fuel control. Hydromechanical fuel controls were used and are still used on many engines, but their use is becoming limited giving way to electronic-based controls. Fuel controls have two sections, computing and metering, to provide the correct fuel flow for the engine. A pure hydromechanical fuel control has no electronic interface assisting in computing or metering the fuel flow. It also is generally driven by the gas generator gear train of the engine to sense engine speed. Other mechanical engine parameters that are sensed are compressor discharge pressure, burner pressure, exhaust temperature, and inlet air temperature and pressure. Once the computing section determines the correct amount of fuel flow, the metering section through cams and servo valves delivers the fuel to the engine fuel system. Actual operating procedures for a hydromechanical fuel control is very complicated and still the fuel metering is not as accurate as with an electronic type of interface or control. Electronic controls can receive more inputs with greater accuracy than hydromechanical controls. Early electronic controls use a hydromechanical control with an electronic system added on the system to fine-tune the metering of the fuel. This arrangement also used a hydromechanical system as a backup, if the electronic system failed. Figure 2-49, Hydromechanical slash Electronic Fuel Control. The addition of the electronic control to the basic hydromechanical fuel control was the next step in the development of turbine engine fuel controls. Generally, this type of system used a remotely located EEC to adjust the fuel flow. A description of a typical system is explained in the following information. 
The basic function of the engine fuel system is to pressurize the fuel, meter fuel flow, and deliver atomized fuel to the combustion section of the engine. Fuel flow is controlled by a hydromechanical fuel control assembly, which contains a fuel shutoff section and a fuel metering section. P3 inlet, manual mode solenoid, shown auto mode, servo metering valve assembly, servo pressure regulator, fuel bypass valve, P3 air pressure fuel return slash bypass fuel, evacuated bellows, torque engine, speed set, idle set stop, manual mode came, metering head sensor, overspeed stop, fuel return, fuel inlet, mechanical speed governor, fuel shutoff valve, Fuel outlet, to fuel oil cooler, vane fuel pump. Start fuel enrichment solenoid pressurizing valve. Figure 2-49. Fuel control assembly schematic hydromechanical slash electronic. 2-35. This fuel control unit is sometimes mounted on the vane fuel pump assembly. It provides the power lever connection and the fuel shutoff function. The unit provides mechanical overspeed protection for the gas generator spool during normal, automatic mode, engine operation. In automatic mode, the EC is in control of metering the fuel. In manual mode. The hydromechanical control takes over. During normal engine operation, a remotely mounted electronic fuel control unit, IFQ, same as an EEC, performs the functions of thrust setting, speed governing and acceleration, and deceleration limiting through IFQ outputs to the fuel control assembly in response to power lever inputs. In the event of electrical or IFQ failure, or at the option of the pilot, the fuel control assembly functions in manual mode to allow engine operation at reduced power under control of the hydromechanical portion of the controller only. The total engine fuel and control system consists of the following components, and provides the functions as indicated. 1. The vane fuel pump assembly is a fixed displacement fuel pump that provides high pressure fuel to the engine fuel control system. Figure 2-50, Figure 2-50, Fuel Pump and Filter. 2. The filter bypass valve in the fuel pump allows fuel to bypass the fuel filter, when the pressure drop across the fuel filter is excessive. An integral differential pressure indicator visually flags an excessive differential pressure condition before bypassing occurs, by extending a pin from the fuel filter bowl. Fuel pump discharge flow in excess of that required by the fuel control assembly is returned from the control to the pump interstage. 3. The hydromechanical fuel control assembly provides the fuel metering function of the IFQ. Fuel is supplied to the fuel control through a 200 micron inlet filter screen, and is metered to the engine by the servo-operated metering valve. It is a fuel flow slash compressor discharge pressure, WF slash P3, ratio device that positions the metering valve in response to engine compressor discharge pressure, P3. Fuel pressure differential across the servo valve is maintained by the servo-operated bypass valve in response to commands from the IFQ. Figure 2-49, the manual mode solenoid valve is energized in the automatic mode. The automatic mode restricts operation of the mechanical speed governor. It is restricted to a single overspeed governor setting above the speed range controlled electronically. The energizing the manual mode valve enables the mechanical speed governor to function as an all-speed governor in response to power lever angle, PLA. The fuel control system includes a low power sensitive torque motor which may be activated to increase or decrease fuel flow in the automatic mode, IFQ mode. The torque motor provides an interface to an electronic control unit that senses various engine and ambient parameters and activates the torque motor to meter fuel flow accordingly. This torque motor provides electromechanical conversion of an electrical signal from the IFQ. The torque motor current is zero in the manual mode, which establishes a fixed WF P3 ratio. This fixed WF P3 ratio is such that the engine operates surge free and is capable of producing a minimum of 90% thrust up to 30,000 feet for this example system. All speed governing of the high pressure spool, gas generator, is achieved by the flyweight governor. The flyweight governor modulates a pneumatic servo, consistent with the speed set point as determined by the power lever angle, PLA, setting. The pneumatic servo accomplishes WF P3 ratio modulation to govern the gas generator speed by bleeding down the P3 acting on the metering valve servo. The P3 limiter valve bleeds down the P3 pressure acting in the metering valve servo when engine structural limits are encountered in either control mode. The start fuel enrichment solenoid valve provides additional fuel flow in parallel with the metering valve when required for engine cold starting or altitude restarts. The valve is energized by the IFQ when enrichment is required. It is always de-energized in the manual mode to prevent high altitude sub-idle operation. 2-36 Located downstream of the metering valve are the manual shutoff and pressurizing valves. The shutoff valve is a rotary unit connected to the power lever. It allows the pilot to direct fuel to the engine manually. The pressurizing valve acts as a discharge restrictor to the hydromechanical control. It functions to maintain minimum operating pressures throughout the control. The pressurizing valve also provides a positive leak tight fuel shutoff to the engine fuel nozzles when the manual valve is closed. 4. The flow divider and drain valve assembly proportions fuel to the engine primary and secondary fuel nozzles. It drains the nozzles and manifolds at engine shutdown. It also incorporates an integral solenoid for modifying the fuel flow for cold starting conditions. During an engine start, the flow divider directs all flow through the primary nozzles. After start, as the engine fuel demand increases, the flow divider valve opens to allow the secondary nozzles to function. During all steady state engine operation, both primary and secondary nozzles are flowing fuel. 
74 micron. Self-bypassing screen is located under the fuel inlet fitting, and provides last chance filtration of the fuel prior to the fuel nozzles. 5. The fuel manifold assembly is a matched set consisting of both primary and secondary manifolds and the fuel nozzle assemblies. 12 fuel nozzles direct primary and secondary fuel through the nozzles causing the fuel to swirl and form a finely atomized spray. The manifold assembly provides fuel routing and atomizing to ensure proper combustion. The EEC system consists of the hydromechanical fuel control, FQ, and aircraft mounted power lever angle potentiometer. Aircraft generated control signals include inlet pressure, airstream differential pressure, and inlet temperature plus pilot selection of either manual or auto mode for the IFQ operation. Engine generated control signals include fan spool speed, gas generator spool speed, inner turbine temperature, fan discharge temperature, and compressor discharge pressure. Aircraft and engine generated control signals are directed to the IFQ, where these signals are interpreted. The plot potentiometer is aircraft mounted in the throttle quadrant. The plot potentiometer transmits an electrical signal to the IFQ, which represents engine thrust demand in relation to throttle position. If the IFQ determines a power change is required, it commands the torque motor to modulate differential pressure at the head sensor. This change in differential pressure causes the metering valve to move, varying fuel flow to the engine as required. The IFQ receives electrical signals which represent engine operating variables. It also receives a pilot-initiated signal, by power lever position, representing engine thrust demand. The IFQ computes electrical output signals for use by the engine fuel control for scheduling engine operation within predetermined limits. The IFQ is programmed to recognize predetermined engine operating limits and to compute output signals such that these operating limits are not exceeded. The IFQ is remotely located and airframe mounted. An interface between the IFQ and aircraft slash engine is provided through the branched wiring harness assembly. Figure 2-51, FADEC Fuel Control Systems. A full authority digital electronic control, FADEC, has been developed to control fuel flow on most new turbine engine models. A true FADEC system has no hydromechanical fuel control backup system. The system uses electronic sensors that feed engine parameter information into the EEC. The EEC gathers the needed information to determine the amount of fuel flow and transmits it to a fuel metering valve. The fuel metering valve simply reacts to the commands from the EEC. The EEC is a computer that is the computing section of the fuel delivery system, and the metering valve meters the fuel flow. FADEC systems are used on many types of turbine engines from APIS to the largest propulsion engines. FADEC for an auxiliary power unit. The first example system is an APU engine that uses the aircraft fuel system to supply fuel to the fuel control. An electric boost pump may be used to supply fuel under pressure to the control. The fuel usually passes through an aircraft shutoff valve that is tied to the fire detecting slash extinguishing system. An aircraft furnished in line fuel filter may also be used. Fuel entering the fuel control unit first passes through a 10 micron filter. If the filter becomes contaminated, the resulting pressure drop opens the filter bypass valve and unfiltered fuel then is supplied to the APU. Shown in figure 2-52 is a pump with an inlet pressure access plug so that a fuel pressure gauge might be installed for troubleshooting purposes. Fuel then enters a positive displacement, gear type pump. Upon discharge from the pump, the fuel passes through a 70 micron screen. The screen is installed at this point to filter any wear debris that might be discharged from the pump element. From the screen, fuel branches to the metering valve, differential pressure valve, and the ultimate relief valve. Also shown at this point is a pump discharge pressure access plug, another point where a pressure gauge might be installed. The differential pressure valve maintains a constant pressure drop across the metering valve by bypassing fuel to the pump inlet, so that metered flow is proportional to metering valve area. The metering valve area is modulated by the 2-37 Bleed Valve TT4 5 P0 T13 NL PT0 TT0 NL Trim and Engine ID Starter General Control Solenoids and Relays P3 PMG Fuel Control Igniter New Hampshire Mechanical Linkage New Hampshire Backup Mode EQCell PWR TM WF slash P3 IGN Cont PLA IGN Power Cont FQ 400 Hz 28 V PWR Potentiometer Mode cell SW, fault status IND control mode IND, flight data recorder, engine monitoring system, IFQ crosslink, New Hampshire NLPT0, plot TT0, T4, 5, T13, P, symbols, core spool speed fan spool speed free stream total pressure power lever angle total temperature interturbine temperature fan exit air temperature indicated airspeed, engine control system, figure 2-51, engine control system, torque motor, which receives variable current from the EQ. The ultimate relief valve opens to bypass excess fuel back to the pump inlet whenever system pressure exceeds a predetermined pressure. This occurs during each shutdown since all flow is stopped by the shutoff valve. And the differential pressure valve is unable to bypass full pump capacity. Fuel flows from the metering valve out of the FQ through the solenoid shutoff valve and onto the atomizer. Initial flow is through the primary nozzle tip only. The flow divider opens at higher pressure and adds flow through the secondary path. 2-38 High pressure pump Pump discharge port metering valve pump inlet pressure. 70 micron screen. Torque motor. EQ. 
Ultimate relief valve. Filter bypass valve. 10 micron inlet filter. Legend. Pump discharge pressure metered pressure inlet pressure. Metered outlet port. Fuel shutoff solenoid. Metered pressure. Inlet P valve. Automizer. Igniter plug. Figure 2-52. Apu fuel system schematic. Fadec fuel control propulsion engine. Many large high bypass turbofan engines use the Fadec type of fuel control system. The EEC is the primary component of the Fadec engine fuel control system. The EEC is a computer that controls the operation of the engine. The EEC housing contents two electronic channels, two separate computers, that are physically separated internally and is naturally cooled by convection. The EEC is generally placed in an area of the engine notch L that is cool during engine operation. It attaches to the lower left fan case with shock mounts. Figure 2-53, the EEC computer uses data it receives from many engine sensors and airplane systems to control the engine operation. It receives electronic signals from the flight deck to set engine power or thrust. The throttle lever angle resolver supplies the EEC with a signal in proportion to the thrust lever position. The EEC controls most engine components and receives feedback from them. Many components supply the EEC with data for engine operation. Power for the EEC comes from the aircraft electrical system or the permanent magnet alternator. PMA. When the engine is running, the PMA supplies power to the EEC directly. The EEC is a two-channel computer that controls every aspect of engine operation. Each channel, which is an independent computer, can completely control the operation of the engine. The processor does all of the control calculations and supplies all the data for the control signals for the torque motors and solenoids. The crosstalk logic compares data from channels A and B and uses the crosstalk logic to find which EEC channel is the best to control the output driver for a torque motor or solenoid bank. The primary channel controls all of the output drivers. If the crosstalk logic finds that the other channel is better for control of a specific bank, the EEC changes control of that one bank to the other channel. The EEC has output driver banks that supply the control signals to engine components. Each channel of the EEC supplies the driver banks with control signals. The EEC has both volatile and non-volatile memory to store performance and maintenance data. The EEC can control the engine thrust in two modes, which can be selected by use of a mode selection switch. In the normal mode, engine thrust is set with EPR. In the alternate mode, thrust is set by N1. When the fuel control switch is moved from run to cutoff, the EEC resets. During this reset, all fault data is recorded in the non-volatile memory. The EEC controls the metering valve in the fuel metering unit to supply fuel flow for combustion. Figure 2-54. The fuel metering unit is mounted on the front face of the gearbox and is attached to the front of the fuel pump. Figure 2-55. The EEC. 2-39. Programming plug lanyard. Electrical connection. Type. Shock mount. Type. Channel B. Channel A. Test connection. Engine. EEC. Figure 2-53. EEC and programming plug. Figure 2-55. Fuel pump. Figure 2-54. Fuel metering unit. Also sends a signal to the minimum pressure and shutoff valve in the fuel metering unit to start or stop fuel flow. The EEC receives position feedback for several engine components by using rotary differential transformer, linear variable differential transformer, and thermocouples. These sensors feed engine parameter information from several systems back to the EEC. The fuel control run cutoff switch controls the high pressure fuel shutoff valve that allows or cuts off fuel flow. The fuel temperature sensor thermocouple attaches to the fuel outlet line on the rear of the fuel slash oil cooler and sends this information to the EEC. The EEC uses a torque motor driver to control the position of the metering valve in the fuel metering unit. The EEC uses solenoid drivers to control the other functions of the FMU. The EEC also controls several other subsystems of the engine, as shown in figure 2-56. Through torque motors and solenoids, such as fuel and air oil coolers, bleed valves, variable stator vanes, turbine cooling air valves, and the turbine case cooling system. 2-40 Prog plug Fock bypass valve FMU 2.5 bleed valve. TAC valve. NOC valve. MA VS VTCC valves. INOC valve. Sensors 2.9 bleed valve. BU General lock valve. NAC zone vent valve. Figure 2-56. Systems controlled by EC. Each channel of the EC has seven electrical connections, three on each side and one on the bottom. Both channels share the inputs of the two connections on the top of the EC. These are the programming plug and test connector. The programming plug selects the proper software in the EEC for the thrust rating of the engine. The plug attaches to the engine fan case with a lanyard. When removing the EEC, the plug remains with the engine. Each channel of the EEC has three pneumatic connections on the bottom of the EEC. Transducers inside the EEC supply the related and opposite EEC channel with a signal in proportion to the pressure. The pressures that are read by the EEC are ambient pressure, burner pressure, LPC exit pressure, and fan inlet pressure. Each channel has its own wire color that connects the EEC to its sensors. Channel wiring is blue, and channel B sensor signals are green. The non-EEC circuit wire is gray, while the thermocouple signals are yellow. This color coding helps simplify which sensors are used with each channel. Fuel system operation. The fuel pump receives fuel from the airplane fuel system. 
The low pressure boost stage of the pump pressurizes the fuel and sends it to the fuel slash.